Okay, so now that we've introduced what a mole is, now we're going to apply this idea towards stuff. So the last video, was, it was real short. I'll admit that. I didn't have a lot to say. I mean, what is a mole? It's a number. End of story. I didn't want to make it super long either by, by dragging all this stuff into it. Um, so, yeah, that one ended up being pretty quick. But, we are going to figure out how to find molar masses for stuff. So first, you know, what is a molar mass? All right. So molar mass is a general term. There's a few more specific terms for it, but it's essentially um, how many grams are in a mole of something. Okay. So, you've got a mole of hydrogen. It's going to be some number of grams. So here's the cool thing. So moles are, you know, what are used in chemical reactions. They, they are molecules bumping into each other. So if I have one of these, one of these, and they combine, and now I have a new compound, that's a chemical reaction. And so they're very, very much like putting a bike together. You need a seat and two tires and handlebars. Having four tires isn't going to really help you put a bike together. Maybe you can start on a second bike, but you got to have the pieces. They've got to come together. They've got to connect. And really, on the molecular level, that's what's happening in chemical reactions. And so it's these pieces. But, you know, handlebar tires, they don't weigh the same. And so molar mass lets us work with that. So we're not ever, you know, getting out little tiny tweezers and being like, there's a carbon atom, there's a carbon atom, carbon atom. Oh, there's a hydrogen over here. We're going to put that one over there. No, they're all so small, we can't do that. So we have to work with different equipment. We're not going to be counting atoms. We're not going to be counting molecules. What we do is we use balances and we measure grams. So when we work in labs, I throw 10 grams of a substance on the balance, and then I put it in a beaker and use it in a reaction. Something like that. That's what I do. Now, I can use molar mass to flip those grams into however many particles I'm working with. And generally, I keep it in moles because, well, I think I made the point now. It's easier. We'll just leave it at that. So, um, we're going to talk about how to find the molar mass of an element. Then we'll talk about how to find the molar mass of um, different compounds, ionic, covalent, whatever it is. Whatever they are, we'll talk about how to do that. In the next video, we'll use it for some math conversion stuff. So, uh, molar mass, what, co what else can I say about it right here? Uh, it's always going to have units of uh, grams per mole. So we always have grams over moles here. However many grams are in a mole, that's what we're writing. And there's a few different um, flavors of it. So you can have atomic weight or atomic mass. These are the same thing. And this is the molar mass for an atom. Okay, so we just have a specialized name. So molar mass is kind of an umbrella term that covers everything. So I'll probably end up saying it a lot because then I don't say the wrong term ever. But if you see or ever see atomic weight, atomic mass, well that just has to do with the molar mass for an atom. Generally a specific type of element. Uh, what else do we got? We've got formula weight. Okay. And this is the molar mass for ionic compounds. Now you can always just say ion, or, uh, molar mass and have all your bases covered, which is what I do. And so you can do that too. You can just say molar mass, molar mass, molar mass. But if you see the term formula weight when you're reading your book or something, they're talking about molar mass, but it's specifically for ionic compounds. So you don't say an atom has a formula weight. And you don't say a covalent compound has a formula weight either. So it's just for ionic stuff. And so then the last one is the molecular mass. And you might have already guessed what this is for. So this is uh, for covalent compounds because they make molecules. Okay, so these are all three terms that are all just different types of molar mass. Like, oh, my friend has a car. Right? Or you could say, oh, my friend has a Kia, which still technically qualifies as a car. Uh, or maybe they have a Volkswagen, in which case they're obviously good people. You should keep those friends close. Um, and I'm not just saying that as someone who drives a lot of Volkswagens. That wouldn't influence my opinion at all. 
If you want to know how to work on a car, by the way, buy a Volkswagen, because no one else will fix it for you. All right. And, well, I mean, you can take it to the dealer, and they'll try to sell you a new Volkswagen, but that's about it. Um, good internet community, though. They'll talk you how to fix anything on those things. They're like, oh, you need to replace the entire engine? Here's how you do it in 25 short steps. So, how do we know what the molar mass is for something? Well, we're going to start small. We're going to start with atoms. And the formula weight and molecular mass, it's the same trick once you know how to find the, the molar mass of an atom. Now, the cool thing is we don't have to memorize anything, which means our old friend, the periodic table, comes back. So remember, I talked about these atomic weights. Well, that's atomic weight. But I said this was AMUs. I said this is 12.011 AMUs. So the most common form of carbon had six, you know, it has to have six protons, but it also would have six neutrons to give it a mass of 12. 12 atomic mass units. Because you'd have six, get all the fingers in there. Uh, protons, that's six AMUs. You have six neutrons, that's six AMUs. You put them together. You get 12. I don't have enough fingers to show that. I only have five on each hand. I'm one of those people. So, what does this atomic weight tell us? Well, remember it was the average. So this was the average of all the isotopes. So if I have a ton of carbon, the average is perfectly valid value. Perfectly valid value, excuse me. So, uh, on average, carbon is 12.01. Yeah, we're going to ignore that one because life is short. 12.01. AMU. Well, guess what? If I have a mole of carbon, I have a ton of carbon, so the average just works. So one mole of carbon well, that's Avogadro's number of carbon atoms. And so that means that the atomic weight here in AMU is the same as the atomic weight or, I'm sorry, is the same as the molar mass in grams per mole. So it's going to be 12.01 grams. So one mole of carbon weighs 12.01 grams. So all we have to do is just a new trick with the periodic table. If you look at hydrogen, there's a 1.01 .01 here. That means it's 1.01 .01 grams per mole. Or, um, you know, helium. We look at helium there. That's 4.00. So one mole of helium equals 4.00 grams. And what we can do with this, too, is we can make conversion factors out of it. And so I just say, oh, I have 12.01 grams for every mole when I'm working with carbon. Guess what that is? That's a molar mass. It has units of grams per mole. So it's a compound unit. It's a conversion factor. And it just comes straight off our periodic table. So you just got to remember that little trick. Just take the number and just add grams per mole after it, and you've got a molar mass. So what's... Oh, sorry, this is supposed to be helium. Hopefully that doesn't have to be in the screenshot of the video. But look at the chemistry genius over there with his magic hydrogen. That's four times heavier than normal. All right, so what is our molar mass for helium going to be? Well, it's just 4.00 grams per mole. And the reason this works out is because there is one mole of AMUs, becomes one gram. So I have one mole of 12.01 AMUs, it becomes 12.01 grams. So it's a little bit tricky to wrap your head around at first. And if you can, that's great. And if not, just shortcut it. Just remember, I've got all the information I need right here. Gee, I wonder what um, the molar mass of niobium is. Because, you know, you've been wondering that for a while. Well, that's right here. And I didn't just say that because it was just having to be the first one I looked at, but it's 92.91 grams per mole. I guarantee you I did not memorize that number. Trust me. I have sadly memorized these two because I work with them a lot, or I used to. You take organic chemistry, you will end up knowing the molar mass for carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, um, maybe chlorine, and phosphorus off the top of your head. Because you just use them all the time for a year. All right, so this is how we find molar masses for atoms. So we use the periodic table. That's all we do. We just use the periodic table. We find our molar masses for atoms. 
or I'm actually going to be a little more specific, I'm going to say elements, right? Because it varies element to element. And the cool thing is when we work with moles, we don't have to guess what isotope we're working with. We go, oh yeah, it's just the usual random assortment of isotopes um, with the proportions here on Earth. Now, if you ever go to another distant part of the galaxy or universe, um, or maybe even in a, a different part of the solar system, you probably would have to have a different periodic table. Like, humans ever colonize Mars? And I'm only telling you this because I was so proud of myself one time when I realized that talking to a class. But, like, you, we would have to have, like, periodic table of the elements, and then we have to add a little, like, on Earth. And there'd be periodic table of the elements and be, like, on Mars. Um, the moon is about the same because the moon came about from a collision between Earth and something else, so it's all mixed up. But uh, everything else in the solar system probably needs its own periodic table. Even the moon a little bit. Alright, so. We know how to find atoms. But what about molar masses for compounds? Yeah, ta-da, look at that. He didn't even know I wrote what I was writing. Okay. So, molar masses for compounds. What do we do? You know, if we have to find something like, uh, how about NaCl? One of my go-to examples. So, this is an ionic compound, so we could also say NaCl's formula weight, but hey, guess what I'm going to do? I'm just going to cover all my bases. I'm just going to say molar mass over and over and over again, because I'm not wrong when I say that. So, how do we find the molar mass for NaCl? Well, we've got one Na, we've got one Cl, we just add them up. How do I know what Na is? Boom! Periodic table. Alright. So. We just add up molar masses. Of all atoms. In compound. It will not weigh any more or less than the sum of its parts. You know, if I wanted to know what a bicycle weighed, I could take it apart. I could weigh the two wheels, like where the chain, the handlebars, the frame, the seat, the brakes, all that. If I add it up, I will get the mass of the bike. Now you're going to say, well, it's easier to just throw a, a bike on a scale. And the answer is yes. And then to that I'll say, NACL is not a bike. <laughs> you're not going to get one on a scale. You're not going to get one on a balance. And if you do, it's so light it won't even show up. So what we do is we just throw a bunch on there and then, you know, work some tricks out to, to get it sorted out. So, uh, or if we know the formula, if I know a bike has these pieces but I don't have one to put on a scale, I can add up the pieces and know the mass of the bike. So that's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're doing. We're, we, we know the mass of all the pieces, so we're just going to do that. So sodium, I've got one of them, and it's 22.99 grams per mole, so we're not using AMU anymore. Okay. And then we've got one chlorine at 35.45 grams per mole. Alright. And we just add them up. And so we get, let's see, we get 0.44 grams per mole. I'm not done, don't worry, no, it's more than 0.44. We get 70, what, 78, looks like. No, sorry, that is bad math. 58, there we go. 58.44 grams per mole. Thankfully, I caught myself where the Sharpie hit the hit the uh, paper. That would have been bad. All right, and then, yeah, good habit. We're just going to box our final answer. There we go. 58.44 grams per mole. We just add the pieces up. So let's do another example with this. We'll do a covalent compound this time, mix it up. Bring our old friend methane back into the picture. Everyone always loves it when methane shows up. It smells so wonderful. Been around a lot of cows. You smelled methane. Been stuck in an elevator with somebody that had a lot of burritos or something. You probably smelled methane. Alright, so CH4. Uh, what do we do? Find the molar mass? Just add up the pieces. So, we pull out our periodic table. Carbon. Hey, look. Carbon's really blown up here. I got one carbon, 
at 12.01 grams per mole. So remember, I'm I'm not going past the hundredths place. PR table has more information than that. That's fine if you want to. I won't stop you. But I am, you know, a man of shortcuts. And here's one of them here. So I have hydrogen. I could add four hydrogens up, or through the cunning art of multiplication, I just say I got four of them. So it'll be four times whatever one is. One of them is. And that is 1.01. .01. Grams per mole. Okay, so I get these numbers from my periodic table. I know how many of them to add together from my formula, and then I just follow through with the math. All right, and so I get 16.05 grams per mole. Now I'm all double checking myself after I almost screwed up NACL so horrifically. But hey, that's just to show you that no matter how hard you work in life, you can still screw up in front of an audience, okay? Luckily, again, Sharpie didn't hit the, hit the paper, so. I could edit that so it never happened, but that would involve me rendering the video on my computer, and that would add at least 10 minutes to the time it takes me to get this on the internet. So that's not happening. Alright, so we would call this a formula weight because it's ionic compound, or, again, molar mass works. We would call this a... Uh, um, a molecular weight or um, or a molar mass. Either way works. So molecular weight or molecular mass, actually, excuse me, is probably more common than molecular weight because it's a molecule. It's a covalent molecule. It's all non-metals, no polyatomic ions. This has a metal and a non-metal, so it's ionic. So the specific ionic term would be formula weight. So just, it's a little bit of vocab, but they're all molar masses. They all have units of grams per mole. Um, and uh, so you'll see those terms used throughout, but they're always just referring to the same thing, just grams per mole. So that's what we're doing. And so what we're going to do in the next video is, I mentioned how this is like a conversion factor. Well, we're going to use it as a conversion factor. We've got units of grams, we've got units of moles. We can convert between grams and moles. And I kind of talked a little bit about why we might do that already, but I'll make sure that that is crystal clear at the start of the next video. All right, so... Uh, at this point, you should be comfortable with what a mole is. You should be able to find the molar mass of an atom, or the atomic weight, and understand that that will have units of grams per mole. Now, it's not like these aren't still AMU. The difference is just, if I have one carbon, it's like 12 or 13 AMU, depending on what isotope it is, or 14. If I have a mole of carbons, a bowl full of a mole of carbons, um, then you have 12.01 grams of carbon in there. And the another thing about moles that I'll just mention at the end here is they can have all the um, prefixes of the metric system on them. So you can have like a millimole, and that's just 10 to the negative 3, so there's 1,000 of these in a mole. And you can have a micromole and a nanomole, and chemists will work with these small amounts. And you can go smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And there was this. This is this is the honest truth. I saw it at a I saw it at a, a um, talk I went to. The guy goes up there and he was he was like a single atom or you know single molecule chemist. So they run these laser traps. And and I mentioned before like we don't use tweezers and separate out atoms. Well, this guy essentially uses laser tweezers and does just that. But that's like his specialty. Like that's what. You have to, you know, you have to be a PhD professor with a research group, and this is what you do. What do you do once you get them by themselves? I don't know. You just hold them in solitary confinement and shoot them with more lasers and see what happens. But anyway, he proposed a new prefix. He said, okay, well, you know, if a mole is, you know, about 6 times 10 to the 23, he said... So he's working in the range of, you know, his range of work is around single atoms. So it's about, you know, 1 over 10 to the 23rd, whatever that is. So very, very small amount. And so, you know, this is like 1 over a third, you know, 1 over 10 to the 3. So micro, nano, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, ado, femto, so on and so forth. 
he proposed, well, if it gets really small, this is a 23, by the way, uh, there should be a new prefix. This is true, I swear this is true. I saw this happen in front of a room full of scientists. And apparently, my professor said he does it every time he gives a talk. He said, 1, 10 to the 23rd of something should have the prefix guaca. Okay? And therefore, his work is in the, not millimolar range, the guacamole range. The guacamole range. He wanted that. That was his pitch. I don't think it's happened yet. He's got to move not one, but probably two or three mountains to make it occur. But that was honestly the truth. And so if you had, he's saying, just to be clear, if you have 10 times, 10 to the power of negative 23 moles, this would equal a guacamole. That was, that was his life's work. I think more than the laser trapping and getting single atoms, I think if he ever gets that off the ground, like that will that will be what's on his headstone. Like that will be the life accomplishment of that scientist. And it, I'm serious. It was there were like 300 people in the room. He's giving a big presentation, and this is what he closed with. This was the closer. Like this is where he went at the end. And my professor said that he that he did that every year. Like that was that was his pitch. Um, and I, I know the scientific field well enough to know that I suspect that this will get off the ground eventually. He'll have students that carry on the, the torch. It'll spread. It's, it's going to happen. We will have guacamoles in the metric system. All right? It will happen. All right. So uh, next we're going to talk about what to do with these conversion factors. How to use them. Just to kind of sketch it out. How do we go between grams and moles? Um, so very much section two math review material just with new units is what we're doing so if you're feeling a little uneasy about conversion factors good news you get another opportunity to practice them maybe you can maybe you can get the hang of it now uh feel free to loop back look at the old stuff if you're unsure um but there's only gonna be one trick we're doing with them so yeah, it's not all of the conversion factor stuff just that kind of notations coming up